King Nebuchadnezzar has erected a 90-foot statue, an image of gold, and he's called together from his far-flung empire uh, leaders, uh, speaking many languages, dressed in their uh, native garments. They're coming from all over the world, princes, governors, sheriffs. And they have been commanded as they make their way out into this great uh, plain of Duran. They have, they have been commanded that at the sound of a great orchestra, as soon as it begins to play, they will all bow down and they will all worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar erected in this plain of Dura. Uh, three Hebrew children have been taken captive out of Jerusalem and they've been brought by the Chaldeans into Babylon to the palace of Shushan and they've been trained in the language of the Chaldeans and they, along with Daniel, have been appointed as leaders of the government. These three men refuse to bow when the orchestra begins to play. Jealous leaders take the message to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar flies into a rage. says, bring them. Nebuchadnezzar, in the meantime, orders that a brick kiln oven be heated seven times its normal heat. He sends his men, his guards, and they bring these three Hebrew children. There's a rage in this man. How would anybody in my government uh, stand up against me and disobey me? Now, it was not unusual in those days to roast people in fires. In fact, Jeremiah speaks of Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon, Babylon roasted in the fire. Two kings that he roasted. This is in the prior, just prior to this time. This, this king, no doubt, had roasted a number of people who had been disobedient. He knew what it was to see bodies thrown into a furnace and that sudden flash of burning bodies and he smelled the stench of burning flesh. So there's nothing new. And he says, tell me now, is it true that you will not bow? You did not bow, you will not bow. He said, we're going to do it again at the sound of the trumpet, at the music, the dulcimers. If you will not bow, their fire is being prepared seven times hotter and you will be carried by my army men into that fire and you will be roasted. Now, folks, the, these men could see the fire. I'm sure they could almost feel the flames. They could feel the heat, the intensity. These men didn't want to die. They were human beings like you and me. Anybody would be crazy to want to die roasted in a fire. These men had something in their heart that that God had placed there by His Holy Spirit, mighty. And so they said, we, we, we don't have to even think about answering you, O King. We will not bow. Our God is able to deliver us, but if not, we are going into the fire. And you know the rest of the story, and it must have been quite a sight as they prepared this furnace out in this desert and out in this plain Dura, and uh, multitudes go because they've heard of this great burning. You know, when the, 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 out in the West, when they used to have a hanging, they used to bring their picnic baskets. It was a big thing to go to a hanging. Human nature is such that it delights in this uh, gory stuff. And I can see the multitudes intrigued, wanting to get a glimpse of these men. Just get a glimpse. Somebody said that O.J. tried to go into a theater in Los Angeles and the word got out and all the camera crews were there and his Cadillac had, had to just keep moving because of all the crowds. Curious, just to get a look. The man suffered enough. Let him alone. I mean, I, I, whatever, you, whatever you think about that, folks, uh, I, I say the, the big thing that is in American blood is uh, the thirst for... Uh, the orgies, the, the, the foolishness, the blood. And uh, they, they, they want to get a glimpse of this, these three Hebrew that withstood the king. And I see the king coming with his entourage and he takes his seat at a certain place within view of this furnace, but far enough away so the heat doesn't affect him. And here come these three men, and they have not bowed, and so they are bound hand and foot, and the king is thinking to himself, will these fools never learn? They're going to be asses in just a few minutes. It's foolishness. They never learn. I keep burning them, and they never learn. These men will be ashes. And they 
the strongest men, the Bible said, in his army, take these men to the mouth of that furnace to cast them in, and they are slain by the intense heat. They fall dead. I don't know if others had to pick them up. I don't know how. They got them into the fire. And all the fire did was burn off the bounds. They were bound hand and foot. And the only thing, there was no flash, sudden flash, of three big flashes of three fires being roasted suddenly. There was no stench of flesh. In fact, the king looks in and he turns to one of his associates and he said, how many did we throw in there? And they said, three. He said, that's what I thought. But I see four. I see four. And one of them is the appearance of the Son of God. Now, folks, how could a heathen king recognize the Son of God? Well, folks, his glory can't be hidden, the Bible says. Even the angels came and they were dressed in white and had a glory. They were bright. Jesus uh, Christ, who appeared, was brighter than the flames. You can't hide his glory. Folks, the story is that Christ appeared. That was not Gabriel. That was not Moses or Elijah raised from the dead, not like on the Mount of Transfiguration. This was not a seraphim that had been sent. This was Christ who appeared in their crisis. Parents of the Son of God. That was a testimony even from heathen lips. That Jesus came to their Christ. Christ came to their crisis. What a wonderful thing to have Jesus come and walk with you through your crisis. Hallelujah. Now we're talking about bringing Christ into our crisis. And you look into that furnace again and you'll see that that is the Son of the living God. Christ walking with them. Now he didn't come to impress that heathen king. He'd already done that in the in two chapters before when Daniel had interpreted a dream and the, the king had said of a truth, your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings. He soon forgot that. Miracles usually impress heathen minds for about three days. And they forget it. The truth, he had said, Jesus, or Christ didn't come as evangelism. This was not an evangelism visit. He was not there to press, impress these heathen. He was not there trying to let them know he was God. He didn't do it for his own name's sake. He came because of these men. He came to comfort them. He came to rescue them because he loved them. Because these men had made a commitment. And God commits himself to those who commit themselves to him. Our Lord does not come to every man's crisis. He does not commit himself to everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Remember when Jesus went to the Passover, a group came, and the scripture says many believed in his name. They believed. They were believers when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in their heart. They, they were willing to acknowledge him as God, in flesh even. But they were not willing to commit the keeping of their lives into his hands. And God, Jesus knew what was in their hearts. He said, I can't commit to you in his thinking. I can't commit to these men because they are not willing to commit their entire being into my hands. I will not commit. I, the scripture says they believe, but he would not commit himself unto them. You know, we live in a society that is bogged down in one crisis after another. You know anybody who hasn't, who is not in a crisis or coming out of one? What about yourself? What kind of a crisis are you facing now? Is it in your marriage? Is it on your job, your business, your career? Is it your health? Now, if you don't have a crisis, just wait a little. <laughs> One's on the way. And beloved, when you're in a crisis, you need Jesus. You need the Son of the living God to walk you through it. He has to appear or there's no hope. Hallelujah. You say, yes, Pastor, I, I want him to come into my crisis. And I know I can't make it without him, but how... Do I get him? The same way the Hebrew children brought him into their crisis. They had made three commitments I want to talk to you about. 
Commitment number one, they committed themselves to a pure, undefiled way of living in the midst of a wicked society. Undefiled, pure lifestyle. I want you to go, please, to Daniel 1 and read one verse, please. First chapter of Daniel. Now remember Daniel and these three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now those were the names given to him by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel always met with these three men. He's always talking about the men that were with me. The men with me. You'll find that in three, two or three places throughout all of Daniel. <coughs> Eighth verse. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king with appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face as worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. He said, Daniel, if you take your course. Daniel had asked ten days of beans and water. No filet mignon. No port wine. No white wine, no kind of wine. You say, how do you know those wines? Read about them in the newspaper. <laughs> Never tasted wine in my life. I don't, I, I don't uh, drink. And I don't think Christians should drink. <laughs> Just threw that in. Can you imagine this man saying, you're going to cost me my life because at the end of 10 days on beans and water, you're going to look sickly. You're going to have sunken cheeks. Look, you need protein. Eat some meat. You need a little wine to build up your blood. You need a little sugar for energy, so eat some of the sweets. Just take a little bit. Now, folks, stop for just a minute. I prayed and prayed about it. I said, Holy Spirit, what is? what are these men? They're not vegetarians. Uh, now, of course... If they ate that, it's unceremoniously clean because almost everything that was presented at the king's table first went to the idolatrous priest and it was blessed by these idolatrous priests. And, and uh, th it was unceremoniously clean for these Hebrews. That's true, but it goes beyond that. And what I'm telling you now, I didn't get out of a commentary because I couldn't find it anywhere. I believe the Holy Spirit showed it to me. Why is it these men did not eat that meat? Why didn't they want to partake of that? Follow me, please. I believe that when these Daniel and these three Hebrew children were led captive into Babylon, their first shocking impression to see harlots on the streets, to see drunken, stupefied men everywhere on the streets, to see the open sin and debauchery, to see even men in leadership who were so uh, dull and stupefied by alcohol and to hear the cursing and to, to come into that society so loose, so immoral, so shocked these men. Daniel, I'm sure, met with these three young men of God. And I, I believe with all my heart this is how it goes. Daniel, and I believe they shared it, they were so shocked at what they'd seen. Their, their spiritual sensibilities were absolutely, they, they were horrified at what they'd seen. The wickedness, the debauchery shocked them. Daniel's saying, now look, you know, because we know that Daniel is a, a, a student of Jeremiah. Jeremiah stays uh, in, in uh, Judah. But he has his writings because it was the writings of Jeremiah that finally made him conclude that the 70 years were up after a season. He was reading Jeremiah at the time, so we know he had the letters, the writings of Jeremiah. We know he had the writings of, of David. We, we know he had kings. He had chronicles. We know he had Moses. He had Deuteronomy. He had the five books uh, of Moses. And he knew he was a student. He knew the history of his people, how quickly they went from idolatry forsaking God. He knew how quick they went into idolatry, how quick they they go into uh, slavery and foolishness and idol uh, adultery, fornication. And he's saying, you saw what I saw on the streets. 
And we, if we are not different, it's not going to be long, I tell you, before our people, our countrymen, are going to look like the Chaldeans, talk like the Chaldeans. They're going to live like the Chaldeans. They're going to be caught up in their sexuality and sensuality. They're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to lose the power with God. We'll build synagogues. You remember, Jeremiah told them to settle in, build houses for 70 years until they're delivered. But you know our people, they will become like the Babylonians. And they will lose the touch of God. They'll be mixed in our synagogues. We have to take a stand. God needs a voice. He needs voices in this time of backsliding. We have got to be different. And they made a commitment. We will not defile ourselves with the spirit of this age. Not their music, not their food. I want nothing to do with it. We will be separate. Now, these men did not go around trying to sell their separation to others. Not even to their countrymen. They didn't try to push their standards on anybody else. They said, we are going to take a stand. It was not just the food. It was the lifestyle. It was everything in Babylon. Folks, listen to me. I look at the backslidden condition of the church of Jesus Christ. I see a nation that's disintegrating so fast it's appalling. You and I know it and every politician knows it. You get any any senator... You get any leader in government, take them aside in an honest moment. They'll admit to you that things are spinning out of control. We have a government right now that's shut down. Doesn't seem to bother anybody. Such incredible sin. Such compromise in the church. Candy cotton preaching. So few men, and I go into my secret closet like this past week for two days, and I'm crying and weeping, oh God, where are your voices? Where are your men that are separated with the prophetic word of God that stand up? Where are the television evangelists that are preaching against sin? You can go to many healing crusades and you won't even hear an invitation. Nobody is being called to the altars. Nobody being called to repentance. People are talking about getting happy. In a time when everything around them is crumbling. Where are the voices? And that's why these men said God is going to need voices in the next 70 years. And folks, when God wanted to speak to Nebuchadnezzar, when God wanted to speak to the nation... The Babylonian kingdom, who did he choose? He chose, he chose Daniel. He chose the three Hebrew children. His voice, that was the only voice left in the land. And I want to tell you, the testimony of these three Hebrew children and Daniel had to affect little Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. I believe that is what inspired the 43,000 who stood strong because there were voices raised up a holy remnant. And I thank God there are still a few voices left. And that's been the prayer of oh God. If you don't do anything else for me, keep me separated. Don't let me become a cot's potato in front of television. God, don't let me go around trying to advertise my separation. Let it be a hidden thing. But let it be so true to you. Let it be so pure and holy that when you want to speak, you'll have vessels. I cried, oh God, where are the congregations? Where are the people that step out so that they can be a voice to their, on their job and a voice in their family? You can't be a voice unless you leave a separated life. If you're, if you're, if your spirit is soiled and tainted by the spirit of this age, God cannot use you as a voice. We're talking about bringing Christ into your crisis. You say, when you're in a crisis, oh, Jesus, where are you? Where are you? Does the Lord not have a right to say, and where were you when I needed a voice? Where were you? In my crisis, when I need a voice, when I need pure vessels that I can speak through, you want me to come to your crisis, and yet you're a part of the system? You, you, you look like the rest of the world. 
You talk like the world, you live like the world. I'm telling you, people at Times Square Church ought to be different than the rest of New York. You don't have to go around saying, I don't do this, I don't do that. Holy Ghost knows what you're doing, though. As long as you're, I've always said, Lord, I don't have to please man. If I please you, then I, anyone who loves you that counts will know that I'm right before you. The only one you're responsible to is the Lord Jesus. You please him, you walk in holiness. Doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. He made a commitment to a separated life. Be undefiled by the spirit of that age. That's what it's going to take now to bring Christ into our crises in this nation. Secondly, they committed themselves to keep... Uh, <clears throat> getting ahead of myself. They committed to become seekers after God. Men who pray. Please go to the ninth chapter of Daniel, please. Ninth chapter of Daniel. Begin verse 3. Oh, by the way, let's, let's go to verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Whose books? The book of Jeremiah. The number of the years wherefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Go to verse 20, please, and 21. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I've seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Folks, the proof is there in every page of Daniel. These were praying men. These were men who made a decision. Now, let me tell you something about prayer. This commitment, the first commitment they made to live a separated life, had to be backed up by a second Commitment to be seekers after God, to be men of prayer, because you cannot keep the first commitment without the second commitment. You cannot live a wholly separated life without being a seeker after God. You have to stay on your knees for the power and the authority to make that commitment possible. You cannot, in your human flesh, without being shut in with God, maintain a separated life in these last days. It's absolutely impossible. Now, folks, keep in mind, Daniel had his own test. He was thrown in the lion's den, much later than the test of these three Hebrew children. And by the way, I don't know if you know it, Daniel was in his 80s when he was thrown in the lion's den. You say, oh, no. Here I am, wondering, I'm 40 years old, Brother Deb, I've been saved 10 years now, and I've been through Christ, and I, I thought by the time I'm 40, 45, 50, it's all over, man. I've, I've learned my lessons Here's an 80-year-old man, a man of prayer, a man of a quiet, tender spirit who served God all his life and 80 years old, still going into a lion's den. What hope do I have? When does it end? It ends when Jesus comes. If, you, if you've got an idea that you say, God, I've had enough trouble. I've had enough crises. I hope I've learned all my lessons. Now, Lord, give me the next 15, 20 years of just laying back in your arms and enjoying prosperity and peace and happiness. Forget it. There is joy, there's peace, there's happiness. But there's a fire furnace, there's a lion's den until you lay your head in his bosom. You're going to be awfully disappointed if you think life is anything else. I'm 60 some years old right now. <laughs> and I thought by now, Lord, after all I've done for you, after all my years of praying and writing and ministering, surely now, Lord, you're going to lay your gray-haired servant down in 
a bed of roses for a while. Lo and behold, tested more than I've ever been tested in all my life. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you something. All the convicting sermons in the world are not going to help you keep your commitment to a separated holy life. Did you hear me? You can sit, you can go to church where there is such a convicting word that pierces your soul. I want to tell you, all the books on holiness will not keep you. All the tapes, how many tapes do some of you have? All of that will not keep you holy, will not keep you pure, will not keep you separated from the spirit of this age unless you have a time every day you're shut in with God because it's that communion. It's that communion. I went to God this week and said, Lord, tell me why you have, you have commanded us to pray. Why is it you don't do anything except by prayer? Why is prayer so important that you demand that of your children? What is it? And the Holy Spirit, here's what I got. It's impossible to love me without seeking me, the Lord said. How do you say you love me when you neglect me days on end? Prayer is the barometer of your devotion to him. And if you love him, you'll be drawn to him. Now, the Bible said faith comes by hearing, but you see the word of God sparks faith, but prayer inflames it. Prayer explodes your faith. The word will spark it, but it's prayer that inflames it. Hallelujah. Prayer is the process of presenting your body's living sacrifice because if, if you can't even go into your, your closet and sacrifice an hour or two before the Lord, how do you present your body? It's a living sacrifice. The scripture says that when Nebuchadnezzar called them out of the furnace, he said, Blessed be your God who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted him and yielded their bodies. He said, you yielded your bodies. Folks, prayer is just that. It's yielding your body. It's fulfilling that scripture. Presents your body as a living sacrifice. It begins in a secret closet of prayer. Now, folks, I, I have quit trying to shame people into prayer. I have quit trying to convict them into prayer. Because I've come to the conclusion that if you don't love him, all the conviction in the world, all the preaching won't change it. It won't get you into your secret closet. It won't turn you into a man or woman of prayer. But I'm going to tell you it's the barometer of your love. If you say in this church, through your singing, through your testifying, I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And you neglect him and you're not seeking him with all your heart daily. Then you're not telling the truth. The Lord's saying you don't love me. And, and you, you say, I want Christ in my crisis. And yet you neglect him. You think he's going to commit himself to people who are not even committed to loving him and seeking his face. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, are going to enter in. Not everyone says, Lord, Lord, will find Christ coming to commit himself to their crisis. Not at all. Finally, they made a commitment to wholly trust God, live or die. They made a commitment to faith, to trust. Go to the third chapter again of Daniel. Third chapter of Daniel. and Let's start in verse 14. Verse 14. Daniel 3, verse 14, beginning to read, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sax, butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, and fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if not, but if you will not worship, but if you worship not, shall be cast the same hour, into the furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we don't have to even think about it. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. 
But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. Glory be to God. What a commitment. Now, the men are facing the most impossible, horrid crisis any human being could face. This is a crisis that demands either God come by miracle and deliver them or they're dead. Now, folks, that's the kind of crisis I'm talking about. And some of you may be going through it. You say, Pastor Dave, I, 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 I am really going through it unless God comes by miracle. Some of you may have been told you have cancer. Some of you are physically afflicted here today. You'd be surprised how many sitting among us are afflicted. And some of you are going through a marriage problem that only God can solve. You know it's a miracle. You've tried everything. You may have been to even psychology and done everything. And you say, I've tried everything. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've done everything. And, and if God doesn't come on the scene, if, if my Lord does not come on the scene, I'm dead. I can't make it. Now, that's the kind of crisis I'm talking about that you may be in or have been there or will be in. What is it that's going to bring Christ into your crisis? It's this, it's this testimony, it's this commitment that's being made here and now. First, they've committed themselves to a separated life. They've committed themselves to be seekers of God. And out of that communion has come such a faith their faith has been inflamed, and here they stand before the king right now. Now, these men surely wanted to live. But you see, they had faith, not in faith, but they had faith in God's faithfulness, knowing that he will do what is right by them, that no matter what comes, what whatever happens to them, that their hands are in God. They're, they're, they're in God's hands. They've committed themselves. Lord, you keep my life. My life is in your hands. Folks, it's amazing that we can trust God with our eternal souls and not with our human bodies. And that's been dealing with me lately about uh, a problem with my boss I've had for years. And I, I'm at the place where I've said, oh God, I see what these men, the kind of faith they had, they committed their very bodies into your hands. And I've come to the place where I know medication doesn't help me. Medication doesn't ease the pain. Medication... There, so there's pain night and day. And, and I come to the place where I say, oh God, if, if I can't trust you with my body, if my bowels are not subject to you, the creator of this whole earth, then how do I entrust my eternal soul into your hands? If I can't even trust my body. And many of us here have never even learned. We haven't even begun to, to know what it is. We want somebody to lay hands on us and hope that person who prays for us has the power with God or the faith that will override your doubts. And you have never yet learned to commit your body or your marriage or your crisis into the hands of the Lord. And I want to tell you something else. These, these men, they knew God was able. We say God is able. He can deliver us. Now, there are a number of ways they could have, that God could have delivered. He could have just changed Nebuchadnezzar's mind. He could have been, he could have so admired their, their courage. He said, hey, anybody's got that kind of courage. And he could have changed his mind. These men could have escaped. Didn't Moses escape King Pharaoh? Oh, yes, they could have escaped. They could have gone. Joseph escaped. He got out. Uh, and I'll tell you something. Listen to me very, very closely. Most of us do not have a faith that includes the words these men used. Our God is able, but if not. Now, folks, this is the kind of faith that causes angels to leap and jump for joy. This is the kind of faith that blesses all of heaven. It's that person or persons who have this kind of faith, this kind of commitment. God, I know, I'm convinced, I'm fully persuaded that you're able to come and rescue me. You can deliver me. I don't have to go through this. If you just speak the word, it's all over. But if not, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to accuse you of not answering me. I'm going to hold faithful and true, and I'll say with Job, though you slay me, yet will I trust you.
Hallelujah. But if not, folks, they, that, that is the faith that these men, I hear people rise up now in indignation. Oh, no, 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 brother Dave, that's negative. You should only say God is able. God's able. God's able. Yes, he is. Oh, I believe that with everything in my heart. He's able to speak the word and creator God can do it at any moment. But what would these men have done if they hadn't had this kind of faith? But if not, what do they do? They culture, they get to the furnace and they see men dropping. They begin to feel the heat and they say, God, these, these men are not standing on their rights. These men are not encouraging one another, throwing promises at each other, trying to pump up their faith. Not at all. These, these men have a quiet dignity. They're being carried to the front. They have a quiet dignity, but they were prepared to die. They were prepared to die. They're prepared to say, Lord, if I have to suffer, if my flesh burns, if I light it, my, uh, the stench of my flesh fills this atmosphere, I'm going out trusting. I will believe. Even if I don't get the answer to my prayer. There are some of you, if God doesn't answer what you are wanting so badly right now, what are you going to do? What will you do? Are you going to accuse him of not loving you? Are you going to say, my faith was too weak? God, you failed me. How a tragedy if these men had gone into the, into the furnace and last words you hear, God, where are you? God, you failed. God, you let me down. What a horrible testimony that would have been to the heathen around them. No, 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 no. They went into the fire, not even thinking right now deliverance. They said, God's able, but if not, if not. Are you willing to believe that Jesus can give you the grace until the answer comes? Do you believe that he can give you the power and the courage to face what you're going through? Are you willing... If it's necessary to lose your business. In this book it says they lost their goods. And they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. And these were those who walked in faith the Bible says. You say are you trying to scare me brother Dave? No. I'm talking about the kind of faith that Jesus commits himself to. These men go into the fiery furnace. Gee, a Christ comes and he appears. They are walking on those flames as though they were rose petals. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's Christ coming into their crisis because really they preferred to be with him than anything else. That's why Paul had such great faith. He said, for me to die is gate. See, the man, the woman who, who has this kind of commitment says, look, I don't care what happens to this body because I'd rather be with the Lord anyhow. To die puts me into his presence. The Lord can do what he pleases. I believe him. And folks, we're to pray in faith. We're to ask God in faith. We're to believe every promise. And we're to claim it and believe it with everything in us. But you wait patiently and if you will just trust him and wait before him and say, Lord, if not, I'm still going to trust you. I promise you he's going to show up. He's going to come into your crisis and he's going to take you by the hand. He's going to walk you through your fire. Uh, I was praying about this and with this I closed. I said, Lord. What they say to you when you showed up, when you came to their crisis? What they say? And the flesh says, "Oh, I know what they said." Oh, thank you, Lord, for keeping us from the pain. And the flesh says, "Oh, I know what they said. Thank you, Lord, for another chance, a few more years." Thank you, Lord, for giving us a little more time. No, not on your life. I know exactly what they said. Lord, take us with you. Don't leave us here. We don't want to go back. 
We've touched the ecstasy. We've touched the glory. Walk us home. <laughs> Folks, until we come to that place where we say, walk us home, and we're not trying to get out of our furnace. We're not trying to run from our affliction. We're fleeing to him. We've touched his hand. We've touched the glory. And we can cry, take me with you, Jesus. When you've got a new Jerusalem state of mind, New York state of mind will never bother you again. Stand, please. Oh, hallelujah. How many would rather be with Jesus? Oh, folks, it's not a death wish. It's a glory wish. Hallelujah. It's not a death wish. Hallelujah. Did you make that commitment to, to the Lord? Lord, I don't want to be defiled by this age. And have you made a commitment to be a man or woman of prayer? And will you come to this final commitment that brings Jesus running to your crisis? Oh God, I've come to the place where I'm not even asking for deliverance anymore. I'm just asking for you to be there. Just be with me. Folks, how many would be satisfied if you just knew Jesus was with you in your problem? Amen. That's, that's all that it takes. I don't know why these are coming. Because I haven't given an old call yet. Keep coming. Whatever God's saying to you, keep coming. Hallelujah. You know, I guess I won't have to give an altar call. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, come to our crisis. Hallelujah. Forgive our unbelief. Forgive our unbelief, Lord. Up in the balcony, God, speak into your heart. If you're backslidden, if you're cold, I don't know what the Spirit's saying to you. Let Him talk. Let us speak your Holy Spirit talk. Speak. Hallelujah. I just have to say this. If you're in a crisis, in a really difficult, hard time, and it's just about brought you down, why don't you come? Lay it on the Lord right now. Say, Jesus... I hear what you say. I'm not going to walk out of this church the way I come in. I'm not going to carry this burden out. You come as we sing it again. Wherever you are all over this building, the Lord's wanting to lift this. He wants to come to your crisis today. All of these that are coming. With all my Come forward in the aisles. Let me let me tell you what I feel the Holy Spirit saying. <clears throat> and I, I have nothing prepared, it's just from my heart. I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking through me now. Because He is desperately trying to reach your heart, to comfort you, give you strength, and to walk with you through your problem, your trials and your crises. Just see if your vessel is full of something, you can't. Faith can't come if it's already full of doubt and unbelief. And before you pray for faith, you've got to drain. You've got to turn the cup. That has to, You have to get rid of all of the unbelief and the doubt before you can even ask God to fill your heart with faith in your mind. So let's begin there. I want you to pray this with me. Jesus, I give you my doubts, my fears, my anxieties. Oh, God. I surrender it all to you. Forgive my unbelief. All right, now let me talk to you a little more about it. Let's go on. Because 
if you're praying out of the abundance of your heart, the Bible says uh, that's the, the prayer that he hears. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. You don't have to scream at him. He's not deaf. You understand that? God can hear. He hears a whisper. He reads your mind. And you wouldn't come down this aisle unless you had a need, unless you're going through it. And the Lord knows that. I'm going to ask you right now to examine your heart before the Lord. Is there anything that stands between you and sweet communion with Jesus? If, if, if you have been watching uh, garbage, if you've been doing things that the Holy Ghost has dealt with you about, I want you to ask the Lord to forgive you right now. Let's pray. Jesus, forgive me for all of those things that I've done and I've been doing that I know in my heart displease you. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse my eyes. Take away my lust. And that thing that I'm doing that I know in my heart is wrong. Convict me and forgive me of every sin, of every evil thing that is hindered the blessing and favor of God. I'm sorry. And I repent. Now look at me, please. Now here's the final step. A simple, childlike faith in what he said is true right now. God, you said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. Will you pray with me, Jesus? I want to believe, and I want to trust you, as the Hebrew children did. I know you're able, but you told me to come to the throne of grace, to find mercy and grace to help me in my time of need. I'm going through my time of need right now. So by faith, I ask you, give me grace. Give me grace to see me through and strength and courage, that I'll not give in, I'll not give up, but I'll know you, Jesus. You walk with me all the way through this. You're going to bring me through to victory. Now, I'm going to pray for you. I want you to listen to me, and then we're all just going to thank him. But uh, look at me, please. You know what grace is? With this, I close. You know what grace is? I woke up this morning. Holy Spirit told me to tell you this. Grace it's simply whatever I need to see me through. Whatever I need from the hand of the Lord to see me through victoriously. Not just to whimper through, but to come through to victory. Grace is anything I need, all the resources of God, to see me through any trial. Hallelujah. Would you reach out by faith and take Jesus by the hand? And say, Jesus, walk with me now. Come to my crisis. Hallelujah. Let's thank you. This is the conclusion of the message.